I'm Mia. I'm a producer, a podcaster, and a filmmaker. I've struggled with chronic pain for the majority of my life, leading to major surgery at 22 and years of struggling to identify the continuing pain. My own journey has shown me chronic conditions aren't just physical, they're also mental. Eating disorders, anxiety, and grief, all being part of it. I want to help people tell their stories of their conditions and the effect they have on their lives, giving voice to what's largely been a silent endemic. Epilepsy is a disorder in which nerve cell activity in the brain is disturbed, causing seizures. Epilepsy may occur as a result of a genetic disorder or an acquired brain injury, such as trauma or stroke. During a seizure, a person experiences abnormal behaviour, symptoms and sensations, sometimes including loss of consciousness. There are a few symptoms between seizures. It is a neurological disorder and seizures are caused by a temporary disruption of the electrical activity in the brain. Approximately 3% to 3.5% of Australians will be diagnosed with epilepsy at some point in their lives and over 250,000 Australians currently live with epilepsy. Epilepsy can start at any age, although it is more likely to be diagnosed in childhood or senior years. There are many different types of epilepsies and people's experiences differ greatly. Some types of epilepsy are age-limited and the person eventually stops having seizures. For others, epilepsy is a lifelong condition. Approximately two-thirds of people with epilepsy become seizure-free with medication. I'd like to introduce you to Zoe from Melbourne who lives with epilepsy. This is going to be her story. Thanks for joining us. Hey, how are you? Thank you so much for coming on the show. Of course. I'm so happy to be here and talk about epilepsy and just raise awareness to it. A bit more awareness to it because there's not that much. There isn't actually a lot. Like I know, you know, I've seen uh, on a couple of shows, I think at one point someone on Neighbours or Home and Away had it at some point, um, but they always sort of just show it from the seizure point of view. But I don't feel like there is a lot of discussion around what it actually is, how it all works. Can you tell us, you know, how old were you when the symptoms started started? Um, so I kind of got them, like the symptoms later in life. So, I mean, still like relatively young, but didn't have it when I was a child or like preteen. Um, I had my first seizure, I believe, like from memory was about uh, when I was 12. So quite late. Um in terms of, you know, for it to just come up and not being born with it. Um, and usually when you're a baby, like, you, you tend to grow out of it. Um, it gets a li- little bit more complicated as you're reaching, like, your later stages of childhood um, and then entering teenhood. So, yeah, I had my first seizure when I was 12, I believe, which was kind of like, Wow. An unexpected seizure, I guess. It's really hard because when you first have them, you don't really know that they're coming on. So it's kind of a really hard thing to gauge what, what's happening to you. It's it's a completely um, foreign kind of feeling. Um, so, yeah, I was just like in front of the computer, like, you know, the family computer on MSN or whatever it was back then and just you know listening to music and then it kind of just happened out of nowhere like I I believe I can only kind of recall from what my parents have said to me about it but it was like when I was um yeah just on the computer and kind of slumped over um I don't really know if it was a full body convulsion um at that time but it was definitely a seizure not exactly sure if it was more of a faint seizure than a full body convulsion convulsion but that was kind of my first experience with it um and kind of not knowing like it was kind of the unknown because you know you don't it's a really weird feeling to have have a seizure and then the onset of that is like it's just a really weird aura that you that your brain goes into before the um action of a seizure happens how often were you did you end up having seizures after that that first initial one? Um, I don't. I mean, I I don't think it was at that often. I'm, I mean, maybe I've blocked a little bit of it out. Um, but I think twelve and under. I don't think I had one again until my thirteenth birthday. 
it was probably really close to like a year after maybe I'm not too sure because I might have been 12 going on 13 but it was uh yeah it maybe was like a few maybe six or so months down the track after that um so I had that before my 13th birthday and I'd known you know I knew that I had this thing but they were like unable to diagnose what it was because a lot of it can also be hormonal and like your body going through like hormonal hormonal changes when you're going from 12 to 13 like there's a lot of things in women that you go through um when you're in the middle of puberty so it also can have um that effect like you can have seizures like like if your hormones are too high or the irregularity of um hormones so that's what they thought it was so they they weren't able to specifically say like you have epilepsy at that time so the next one yeah wasn't until my 13th birthday and it was actually on the day that I was having the party so that was really hard to kind of deal with but you know I've always been the type of person to kind of power through like I had that seizure and you know it does knock you about and it does kind of have you um kind of stagnant and not doing anything for a little bit um but I persevered and was like I'm still having this birthday party like I don't care if I feel unwell I'm still going to do the birthday party and I think at the time when you know you're 13 you don't really know the seriousness of it as much as what you would when you um have more see start to have more recurring seizures well you know parties are the priority when you're 13 yeah Exactly. That's that's exactly right. The parties are the only thing when you're 13, not the other things that might be happening in your life and to your body at the time. When were they able to, like, what did you need to do? How long was it um, until you could get that official diagnosis of of having epilepsy? Oh, so I went all the way from 13 up until three weeks before my 18th birthday when I was actually officially diagnosed. So I had seizures in between then, um, um, but I couldn't, they were never able to diagnose me. One, because they didn't really know what it was. So there wasn't like a significant, like a, a specific answer to why I was having seizures. I didn't have any brain injuries. I didn't have any issues with my brain going up or anything like that. So it was really hard to be like to pinpoint what it was um, and why I was having seizures. So three weeks before my 18th birthday, I had to go and do a test, which was basically stay up all night. And then um, we will do like a kind of sleep MRI test when like the next day so I stayed up from I think it was like seven o'clock that that the night before till nine o'clock the next morning and then had an MRI test and that's where they found like irregularities in my brain so essentially what they came up with is that uh if I'm exhausted or if I get to the point of exhaustion like my brain waves are like irregular so that will bring on the seizure um which makes sense like it actually makes sense a lot of you know like when you're in front of the computer you're and you're you know you're typing away you're in a screen your eyes get tired you start to get like kind of exhausted but you're you're pushing on and you're kind of you're battling with what your body can take I guess and you have a seizure or you know at your birthday party you don't maybe not realize it but you might have like anxiety especially when you're younger you have anxiety about who's coming the stress the not sleeping the night before like it it it, it makes it, it makes complete sense now but at the time I was like why like why am I like this do you know what I mean like why is why is it my sleep that affects me and kind of brings on the seizure why can't it be something else that doesn't maybe isn't going to affect my life as much there's different types of epilepsy. There's sort of different levels, different types, different parts of yep. the brain that are affected. What's what type of what side of the brain is is yours affected in? Like what section of the brain? What um, what sort of level are you at? Okay, so yeah, there's so many different types. So there's ones where you have like full body convulsions. There's ones where it's more like. 
um, you're awake, you're alert, and then all of a sudden you go into kind of like a daydream or a daze and you're not like you're there, but you're not present. Um, and then there's ones that are, there's a lot of, there's a lot of different ones. Like don't quote me, but I think there's like seven or eight different types. Um, where, where's mine? Mine are full body convulsions. I've never really had any other like apps and seizures where I'm kind of in it, where I'm there, but like when, when I'm conscious, but I'm not there. Do you know what I mean? I don't know if that makes sense, but, um, yeah, mine have always been full body convulsions. So never like the, just the full body impact. So never any other type. And it's, uh, what it is, is, uh, generalized mild epilepsy. So it's not like severe, but it's, it's still there. And a lot of my seizures are very spontaneous. So I can be fine for months, years, and then like one will just come on. But relatively now, like being 28, I know what, my body can take and what if I'm pushing my body to that limit then it's you know it might not happen but it it can happen and knowing knowing um how far your body can go I think is the most important thing with my type of epilepsy because if you haven't adjusted to that yet you you you'll be having like I would be having a lot more seizures than what I am now if I was pushing myself and not really caring, which for a lot of years, um, I was doing that. I mean, when you get diagnosed, when you're three weeks before you turn 18, your life kind of changes and you have to navigate the new world where your friends are partying, going out and having a great time and you want to do the same thing. And for so many years, I was doing that and not really taking anything too seriously and yeah, essentially pu- pushing my body to the limits that I shouldn't have really been going to. Yeah, but I guess and at 18 as well, you, you're doing, you are really pushing the limit on everything that you want to do. Like, you know, you know, 18 year olds, you're trying to go out partying, you're trying to also work in there or go to university. Like it's a full on like, how do you keep up with trying to have a sleep and keep up and know that, yeah, you know, sleep is what's going to help you, but you're also trying to to stay with others did it sometimes feel like I guess right at the beginning as you said like when you were 18 and you just sort of did your own thing did it sort of feel like you were sitting on a time bomb because you just never knew when you were going to go into the convulsions oh yeah definitely um when I was younger I think it was more like I knew that I was drinking I knew that I was going clubbing I knew that I wasn't getting like as much sleep as possible so it was it was definitely like, you know, going out and always in my back of my mind, like praying that nothing happens. Um, especially in clubs, you know, they're not the safest places if you need to have a seat, like if you're gone about to have a seizure. So yeah, it was always there, but I don't think it was as serious to me back then. Um, it was, but it was, it's always and still is something that's always in the back of my mind. Um, because I haven't, you know, I, haven't had one like close to three years now but as an epileptic anyone that has epilepsy knows that regardless you're or it's always in the back of your mind um somewhat like very very at the top at the top of the mind actually there because you don't know and if you have ones like me like I'm very lucky in this in the position that I'm in I'm very lucky to not have them every day and suffer them all the time but it's also like, I don't know, I don't know when it's going to happen. And when you're 18 and, you know, I think 18, between 18 and 24, so not even that long ago, it was more like, I don't care, like as in, in a denial period. And I think it's because I didn't know for so long what it was. And then when you're 18 and you get, you get that diagnosis um, in the middle, like when your life is completely changing and your friends are doing all these things, like, it, it sucks like I still don't have my license so that's also something that is a struggle because you don't have that independence as well so getting used to things while you're also changing and getting older and leaving school it yeah it made it difficult to kind of and like balance the two so balance turning 18 and then also and partying and all that and then also having epilepsy it made it 
super difficult. But I hope that answers your questions. I kind of just went on a tangent then. No, no, no. It was really helpful. In terms of your license, have you chosen not to get your license or have you are you not allowed? I think at the time it wasn't it like it just wasn't a choice. Um I had to like come to terms with probably never having my license or like at least having to be three to five years seizure free. And like now being like almost reaching like praying December third, we get to that three year mark. Um I think now it's a conscious decision and a choice not to have it. Um mainly just because um it's for me it's like I don't want to put anyone on the road at risk and also I don't want to put myself at risk and we have so many avenues now to be able to get transport to get uber to whatever we need that I'm become accustomed to it I've I've le- I've become more independent and independent and more adaptable to what I need to adapt to because I I don't have a choice and you know, people that say, oh, you should just get your license. Like, I hate that. I hate that, you know, get your license because it's, it's, it it actually hurts. Like it, it it stings because you're like, well, I'm, I have a choice now with, yes, whether I want to get my license or not, essentially, but I'm choosing not to because of the condition that I have and that it's so sporadic that I can, it, it can have it at any time. So when anyone says that, I, I I kind of cringe and and get a little bit like a little bit angry because I'm like, if had you have you like if you know more about the condition, maybe then tell me. But you're you're saying this based on no no knowledge of what it's like to have epilepsy, and and I hate that. I I do hate when people say that to me. It's it's like oh, it's just pulling. It's just like it breaks my heart because I'm like, I wish I could have my license. I wish I could have that independence, but I don't. And now it's a conscious decision not to have that because I don't want to put anyone at risk, but it still hurts even though I've now made the decision. And it, it's still, it's still hard because you, you, you're tw- like, I'm 28, but in some ways I feel, I feel like I'm a 16 year old because I don't have that independence. And I see, my cousins and people that are younger than me that have a license now and I'm like it makes me feel a little bit smaller compared to them. As you said there's still (laughs) there's so many other ways to be able to get around now with transport and Uber. I think it's I think it's a good thing for for you to be able to make that choice and do what's right for you and do what's right for your for your world and your experience. Can you tell us what it's like? Do you have any memory of what it's like to actually to have the full convulsions and the aftermath of it as well? Yeah, um, look, look, there is ones that I like fully remember and there's ones that um, uh, just escape my brain. Like I won't remember what's happened when I come out of it. Um, but there is, I guess, there's one that was um, quite traumatising. I So couple, like 10 years ago, my, uh, we lived in a family home and things like that and um we had we had it was like an old home so there was like a one it was a single toilet and then like it was a little kind of cubicle thing uh like very old style and um there was maybe like a small basin there and then the toilet was like in the back but they were very close together because it was only a small like a small box essentially and yeah I was there and I was in the bathroom and then um felt the onset of it which which kind of feels like it's really hard to explain, but it's like an aura. So you kind of start to hear like the voices have become distant. The whole like environment around you, whatever sounds you're hearing become quite distant. And, um, and then I guess you can, you can get a little bit um, disorientated, which sometimes when I have them, I will get a bit disorientated. And, but then also it feels like you've, been in that place before so it's a little bit of like deja vu with like sounds in the distance and your brain just goes into a weird weird aura like you just feel like you're in a different different time and a different like you're not you're not where you are like you're not where you're supposed to be your brain just kind of is I guess I don't know what it is it's like a blank noise a little bit like you know those can't even you know when you have like that when the other end of the phone is like 
hung up and you have that blank noise it kind of feels like that's overarching like the aura a little bit and then you kind of go into the convulsion but um the one that I had was quite serious because the way I hit my head like I hit my head because I was like in in the bathroom so I hit my head on the corner of the the sink the vanity and had I hit it a different way like I probably wouldn't be here right now um but that's one that I really do like vividly remember and then after the aftermath is always quite similar um essentially wake up like splitting headache you kind of feel like the floor like you feel very light but the floor like I feel light but the floor feels very heavy um and you can vomit you can vomit you can kind of become incontinent so like uh, both of those things have happened to me um and you can wake up like I guess disorientated to begin with and then slowly um like get out of that but I guess for I think for me it's about maybe a three to four recovery because you're like the whole the whole body convulsions like your whole all your like the whole movement just you're using all your muscles you're using everything so the next day your muscles feel like you've just ran like a like 20k marathon so it's it's pretty it it is pretty intense and it's super hard to explain to someone what it feels like when it's coming on so the descriptions that I probably just said then make no sense but to me it makes sense it's just making someone that doesn't have epilepsy understand like the aura like oh it's the it's the hardest thing to word to make it make sense it just kind of feels like a black noise like something's over something's coming over the brain and you just can't explain what it is yeah, yeah, it's it's really it's it's difficult. It's really hard to describe, but um, that's the beauty of the brain, isn't it? Just they just don't know, they don't know enough about it yet. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty insane. Like it it doesn't sound like something that you want to happen to you. No, it is very it's very very scary when it's happening, and you know, still to this day, it. It, it scares the shit out of me even when I'm not having it. I I'm, I might be walking, I might be at a restaurant and that it's just in constant, constant in constantly in my mind. And I think when I was a lot young, like when I was younger, I didn't have a handle on it and I just didn't know how to treat it, how to treat my body so then I'm healthier and it, it doesn't happen as often. And there's just so much anxiety that comes with it, you know, like even – because mine is sleep essentially like triggered by not having enough sleep like my career is also uh, an actor so when I hopefully one day do book a role like that anxiety that triggers anxiety as well because you have to wake up early and things like that and that goes through my mind probably 20 times a day and and that's the thing it's not just when the seizure is happening it's not just when it's happening it's it, it's harder when it's not happening because you don't know. You don't know. Like, I'm, I've been seizure-free for three years now, but it's it's like how do I know, you know, when it's going to happen again and, and what is that going to be like and I hope it never happens again. So, yeah, it's – it's um, That's fair enough. Yeah. It's, it's just – it's the uncertainty of it, I guess, and a lot of people – live with that uncertainty and that you know not knowing what their future is going to look like because we don't know we just we just don't know you know maybe one day there'll be a cure and this can fix out all our anxieties but I feel like a lot of people with epilepsy live with this heightened anxiety because they just don't know and and that's why in the position that I'm in now I can kind of tell my story and and hopefully have people understand that having anxiety or wanting to have this career that that doesn't necessarily help with sleep and you know having enough energy and all that kind of things it it yeah it can it can really play in my mind and that's the one thing that bugs me the most is just is that is 
I want to have this career. I want to have this crazy, amazing career. But some of the hours and the way it works doesn't necessarily accommodate for for my condition. Um, and that's why I want to make it more of an inclusive thing. So people and people that are head like a part of the production companies are in, and ahead of those crews and TV shows, like maybe they can become more inclusive with people that have epilepsy and understand that. Yeah, because I guess it is one of, like, as you said, you may not have had the seizure for three years, but you're dealing with the uncertainty of not knowing when the next one is going to even be. Are there ways that you're that you're living your life now that is that is helping to slow down those seizures or have make sure that they're not happening at all, other than making sure that you're getting enough sleep? What are some other things that you're doing to to look after yourself? Yeah, definitely. I feel like you know coming into you know 26 27 28 it's it's kind of started to like sink in a little bit more he's the same like I'm not perfect and there's days where I'm like stuffing up and knowing that I'm stuffing up and you know I don't necessarily have an alcohol issue or anything like that but with with Australian culture for a long time and it for a long time it was super hard it was super hard to be like I'm not drinking or know how much to drink, know my limit, know that I can't just be out to all hours of the night. That was super hard. But I think coming into the later years of like your 20s, it makes it a lot easier because your friends start to get on the same page in terms of, hey, we're not like going to be going out every night. We're not going to be drinking every day. I don't really have anything to prove. There's nothing, you know, there's nothing that I need to kind of prove to people who I am or that I'm a fun time and and I think that's what a lot of the things that I was battling with because people were associating me being a fun time with me being super drunk so a lot of it was an identity crisis and I think coming into yeah coming into where I'm at now I I said like I still I still have fun still go to parties still still like go to bars and things like that but I think because my interests have changed and I'm not going to club I'm not I'm not necessarily someone that goes to a club every weekend it's become a lot easier to adapt to it and you know I'm happy I'm happy to just have like two drinks not get crazy and and I think that's helped um managing stress also is a big one like if learning how to manage stress learning how to manage emotions I think I'm just that kind of person that kind of has done it by herself like I haven't I don't really go to therapy, which could like, I don't know, might mind blow like might blow people's minds, but in terms of doing like stuff for that, I've kind of just been the person to kind of just do it. Like figure it out and do it because I know how important it is to stay on the right track. I know what it means to be seizure free and know what it means to not be seizure free. And all I want is to be seizure free for the rest of my life. So I don't really need to go to a therapist as such to tell me like how to manage and ha- how to manage my stress, how to manage my anxiety. Because when I get to points where I am anxious, it's changed now. The anxiety is not about not fitting in or not being able to drink as much as my friends and things like that. It's now more pointing towards career and things like that. And I just have to realize that I can be the change. I can be the person that changes that. I can help have TV producers, all those people see that we can still do and be, we can still be actors, we can still be filmmakers, we can still be everything. We just might need a small adjustment to the schedule for ourselves in some way. And and that's with people that suffer from similar epilepsy to like the triggers and things like that as I do. When you're 18 and when you're 28, that's a 10-year difference. And the way you manage everything is very different compared, like, 18, I was like, I don't care. 28, I'm like, okay, like, I need to now really hone in and focus on what's important to me. And I know who I am. Like, we never fully know who who we are, but we're no longer in that period where we have to prove to people that we're fun. So I, I'm now just kind of managing that and, and just limiting what I, limiting the things that are not going, like are not going to serve me, not going to serve the condition I have in a good way. 
do you have to sort of do you have a lot of medical appointments that you need to go to the regular sort of checkups have they said for you this is a lifelong it's a really tricky thing it's kind of just like so I'm on medication now so I'm on medication for the rest of my life so I take two tablets like one in the morning one at night um, but it is a tricky thing because I, like, I don't believe I'm ever going to grow out of it, but I've been seizure free for three years now. So the worst thing is, is when you say that people think, oh, well, you don't have that anymore. Like you're cool, like you're cured, but it's not necessarily like that. Like I haven't seen, like I've had appointments with my specialist, but I don't go to him like, like frequently unless something is drastically changing. I'm just the luck I'm the lucky side I guess I'm I'm one of the very few that has been able to be stable on my like medication but for a long time it wasn't like that for a long time I was on medication and still having seizures maybe every three to four weeks so uh, you know as you said everything's sort of everything's okay now the medication seems to be working how how long did it take how many different types of medications did it take to find what seems to be the right one now yeah, so yeah, so I'm so it took me quite a while. Um from, you know, thirteen to thirteen not being medicated, so I was five years without medication and then um I think from memory when I was when I just like officially got diagnosed, I was on um a medication called Tegretol, I'm pretty sure, and that was not too bad. Like it was quite it was like there were ebbs and flows, so it wasn't as stable I am as I am now, but it wasn't like bad. It was just not the medication that was suited for the types of seizures that I was having. Um, so then uh, there was one time when I was probably two weeks off going to Bali and I had a seizure, and then that's kind of when my specialist was like, "Okay, um, I was six. I was it was twenty sixteen, so I think I was like." How old? I can't. I didn't even know math. I think I was twenty one by then. But um, <laughs> but they did. Yeah. So he. That's when I changed to the medication that I'm on now because it was more suited to to the epilepsy that I was having. So I think I think I may have changed from only one medication, but I might be wrong. Um, I could have been on another one beforehand, but I just don't. It escapes my mind. And, um, but it did. Obviously, there were huge gaps between those times. So I. I'd be on Tegretol for probably from 2016, from when I was diagnosed to 2016 and then moved to the medication I'm on now from when I was 21 to 28 and still going with this one. So I haven't been frequently changing medications, um, but now that I'm on this one, I, I can I know the difference. I'm not experiencing as many symptoms or, you know, feeling like I'm going to have a seizure and then not having it because sometimes that can happen and it can be more frequent if you're not on the right medication for your particular epilepsy. But a lot of it is, I guess, just a guessing game because they don't know. There's still so many unanswered questions when it comes to epilepsy and there's not as many answers to be able to understand why certain medications work better than others for certain di different types of epilepsy um and because I'm stable right now I haven't I don't frequently see my specialist but when I was younger I was a lot more frequent and um now it's it's more about just doing maybe a six month to yearly checkup to see how I'm going unless something dramatically changes and I'm starting to have seizures every you know three to four weeks again um seem to be going good so far and haven't had to change medications that frequently that's so good though like it's it's, it's yeah and as much as it's been such a struggle and there's so many other things from your anxiety and, and you know the complete uncertainty that you talked about earlier you know at least at least you've got specialists looking after you and it's not something that's happening to you every day anymore and you can really you know, continue on with your life. What do you, what do you really hope for your future and for the future of you know of other people with epilepsy as well? Yeah. So for my future, oh, 
it's such a hard kind of question, hey, because you you want the best, but it, it when you get to the later stages in terms of that your later end of the your twenties, you start to think about things that you haven't really thought about, you know, babies and things like that, and and sometimes that makes that sometimes that makes me happy, but that's that sometimes that also makes me sad because I'm like I want my I don't want my child to take any part of this epilepsy kind of journey that I've taken. I don't want them to have that. I don't want them to have that burden. And, you know, being a woman, I think it just makes that 10 times harder because you kind of have to decide if you want to have children and what that's going to be like and making sure that your pregnancy is safe and everything like that. So I feel like for my future and hoping for my future is I hope that I can and, you know, if I choose to and decide to have a healthy child, whatever, you know what I mean, whenever that is, whatever that that time looks like. Um, but my career, I hope I hope that it flourishes. And my career is kind of just like one thing that I'm, it's my biggest concern um, in terms of having epilepsy with my career. Um, but that's what I, that's what I aim to change. That's what I aim to change with, myself that has epilepsy but also other people and and they don't have to necessarily be in the entertainment industry but I want to share people's stories I want to help them have a better future by sharing their stories and and just cancelling that stigma that epilepsy isn't serious and you know because I haven't because people can't see you know it physically they just assume that it's not serious and and you know, I don't, I don't come across as someone that has anything. Like I, I just come across as, you know, a normal person. And if I'm not having seizures, people tend to assume that I don't have it. Or and that's the same with anyone that has seizures. They have to um, epilepsy. They have to go through that. So my aim is to just promote it more, um, make it more of a thing, and more of a thing that's known within my industry that I want to get into as well. I think that's super important. Um, but I'm also planning just, I have some projects in, in the works next year that are all kind of related to epilepsy and just making a difference and changing people's perceptions of it and just finally just turning the volume up on other people's stories. I can do that. I can know that my health is on a better path and better, better than it's ever been and know that I can help other people whilst they're struggling to get a handle on it and to gain control because it's sad but yeah like some people just never gain control of it and the hardest thing is is you go through life as an epileptic thinking that other people don't have it because no one talks about it it's not spoken about if you have it you you're rarely speaking about it yourself so you know other people aren't going to say it if they have it to you or to anyone either in doing that I hope that helps my future and I hope that helps other people's futures as well that suffer from epilepsy and also people that don't because Mm -hmm. the more more that I can teach other people that don't have it is we're going to be living in a better world and a more understanding world yeah absolutely I agree like it's it's that it's time to to put a light on invisible illnesses you know, especially one like epilepsy where, you know, as you said, you're completely uncertain as to, you know, when you might end up having a seizure, if at all. So it's not like it's something that every room that you walk into, you have to say, hey, by the way, you know, I have this because it might not happen at all. So, which, you know, yeah, is all positive. We don't want you to have the seizures. <laughs> we want you to be okay. Yeah, exactly. But the, the hardest thing is, is, you you don't know you don't know a lot of the time that someone has epilepsy and that's the hardest thing is because people can't put a visual to it or they can't automatically see it it's harder for people to understand and that's what we're trying to fight that's what we're trying to break down that's what we're trying to say is not okay anymore because you can't see it does not mean it's not a serious issue and it doesn't affect like multiple people all around the world you know there's a lot of there's it's more common than ms it's more common than other like you know 
I think it was MS of what I read. It was, it's something out, there's something else, but it's more coming from the top of my mind. The statistics is it's more common than MS and multiple other things that were listed there on the Epilepsy Foundation website, which you can check out. But it, it's, it's a brain issue and it's important. And if people don't see that as important because they can't see it on someone um, immediately when they're looking at them, I, I just think that that's kind of being a little bit ignorant and that's, that's what we want to change. That's what I aim to change. Well, thank you so much, sorry for joining us today and and opening up about about your experience and and you know and all of the struggles that you've you sort of had to go through, you know, since the age of thirteen and and running through all of that. Um, we will put all of the details for your social media, if possible, into the show notes as well as the Epilepsy Foundation website. Thank you again yeah. for joining us. Thank you for having me. And yeah, I hope that, you know, it changes someone's mind as to what they think about epilepsy. So yeah, I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. It was lovely to speak to Zoe about her experience living with epilepsy. If you would like to know more about epilepsy, the Epilepsy Foundation is there to help. Their website link is in the show notes. If you like us, please follow us on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and, of course, across your social media on Instagram at Chronic Combos Podcast and TikTok, chronic.combos. This podcast was recorded on Waterong land. 